Good evening, everyone. Uh, small housekeeping announcement. Uh, please keep your microphone and video turned off uh, for the most of part of the webinar. We would have six to six thirty an optional uh, optional networking session for you if you would like to hang out with the uh, with the audience and um, would like to have any questions for us. You can can shoot at that time, um, and we can. I can unmute you at that moment. So I think we can get started. We have uh, with us today, uh, Ms. Avni Kapoor from uh, CPR, Center for Policy Research, and she's director at Accountability Initiative as well. Uh, they look into specifically social sector spending in the country. We also have uh, Ben from Open Contracting Partnership. Uh, she looks into uh, infrastructure related work at Open Contracting Partnership and heads the infrastructure related vertical. And uh, we have a wonderful audience today. Uh, super excited to interact with you. We are looking to, forward to discuss two major things. Uh, one, a panel discussion on fiscal transparency, and uh, especially in the time of COVID-19 and how different states are responding to it in the country. And second one is the public launch of our tool, Imagine Fiscal Data Explorer. Uh, Shia, if you can just put the agenda shortly. Yeah, so here are the main items today. So uh, we would have five to 525 uh, panel discussion on fiscal transparency and accountability, uh, with special emphasis on uh, social sector spending and procurements. Uh, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, then we have uh, Shreya and Preeti walking us through the Himachal Fiscal Data Explorer and including remarks from both uh, me and Ben. And lastly, uh, uh, networking and Q&A. Uh, now I would request Avni to briefly introduce uh, herself and the kind of work they, they are doing at Accountability Initiative. Over to you, Avni. Thanks, Gaurav. Um, so, as Gaurav mentioned, um, I lead the Accountability Initiative, which is a research group within the Center for Policy Research. We've been studying social sector spending, um, but not just spending, but also just tracking the processes through which implementation happens. Um, so, I was we were talking to Ben earlier about how in, important it is for transparency to for citizens to be able to actually understand how much is getting allocated, how much is getting spent. How is it happening? What is the contracting process and all the other different ways in which government public expenditure happens? And as taxpayers, I think we've been focused on trying to ensure greater citizen engagement in governance. One of our main taglines in some ways is responsive governance. So how do you make sure that governance is responsive both to the people, but also just within itself, um, how do you make sure that it's far more transparent? How do you ensure that it's responsive to the needs of, of the citizens? I'll stop here. Thanks. Thanks, Avani. Uh, ben, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Thanks, Gaurav, and thanks so much for inviting me here today. I'm really excited to be here. I love the work that you do at Civic Data Labs. So I consider myself very lucky to have this partnership with Civic Data Labs and really looking forward to the projects that we're working on together. So a quick introduction, I'm Ben Burns. It's Bernadine, but everyone calls me Ben. I'm the Global Head of Infrastructure at the Open Contracting Partnership, uh, which is uh, my main title, but I also am the Regional Head of Asia. So the work in India here is especially close to my heart. So I'm really, really excited uh, to see this taking off in India. And, and I commend everyone who's been working so tirelessly on this issue. To give you a bit of context on the Open Contracting Partnership, we are a global silo-busting, not-for-profit organization. We work with governments, businesses, civil society, academia, and media to transform public procurement through the power of open data so that everyone can get the goods, services, and work that they need. And the idea behind this is that there are trillions of dollars uh, that are being spent every year in public contracts, so one out of every three dollars that governments spend is on a public contract. So that's a huge amount of money. Um, you know, in some countries, public procurement accounts for 20, 30% of uh, GDP. So that's 
a lot of money that public money, taxpayers money, and we know that public procurement is government's number one corruption risk. So there's a lot of leakage there. And on top of that, there are also losses through mismanagement, inefficiency, and that's also to the tune of about 30%. So the idea is that we need to find ways in which we can transform public procurement so that we can reduce this type of waste so that we stretch the value of every dollar spent so that everyone gets the life-changing good services and work that they need. Thanks a lot, Pam. Thanks a lot for that lovely introduction. Uh, Shia, may I request you to uh, stop presenting for a minute? Um, maybe we can just dive into the panel discussion now. So uh, before that, I would just quickly introduce myself and the kind of work we have been doing at Civic Data Lab. So I am uh, Gaurav Kudwani, and I've been working with Civic Data Lab from its beginning. Uh, what we do at Civic Data Lab is connect data, technology, design, and social science, the four key pillars to strengthen civic engagements. And how, how do we do that is uh, we, we target two areas of civic engagement. One is access to information, and other one is improving participation. So these are the two areas which we have started working uh, uh, majorly in. And the sectors we work in are uh, public finance, law and justice, and urban development. Uh, in public finance, we have been working very closely with the uh, Center for Budget and Governance Accountability, CBJ India, uh, which looks into budgetary research in the country. And with them, we have been building Open Words India, an open data initiative to put together budget spending and and now hopefully procurement data in public domain uh, following certain open data standards so that citizens have better access to this data and can meaningfully participate with their government agencies around, around this data uh, as part of that work we have been looking into different uh, state budgets as well as district treasuries information and uh, we have worked closely with the sam government to put their data in an open format we have worked with a couple of districts in Odisha and Andhra Pradesh to put together their spending information in public domain. And what we realized from that work is the need for building more uh, fiscal data related initiatives because uh, there's a lot of information along with different websites and different formats and in HTML, and which becomes very difficult for citizens to ask and, and analyze and, and put it in something as a spreadsheet tool to do some sort of uh, a mathematical analysis. So uh, what we are doing is collecting all that information from 150 plus uh, government websites, cleaning it up, publishing it here in open format. And with some sort of easy open analytical tools, we are visualizing that information in, in easy to access manner and making those tools open as well so that citizens and other civil society groups, uh, media houses, and, and even public interest technologists can reuse that work to uh, refurbish and, and do analysis in some other geographies. So we would start quickly with our panel. And uh, I would first uh, go to Ms. Avni Kapoor and discuss a few questions on how do they see this pandemic affecting their work? In, in India, we have uh, close to uh, 1.3 million cases now. And uh, there are many deaths which are happening, some reported, some, some going unreported. And states are in a major, major crisis in terms of uh, figuring out how to spend money here. Uh, the revenue sources have also curtailed a bit. So how do you see uh, this pandemic is affecting social sector spending specifically in India? Over to you, Avni. I, you ask a difficult question because I think what has been interesting in some ways, but also challenging is that none of us really know how it's going to affect social sector spending or any form. Um, currently, we've still been in that response zone of how do you immediately react and how do you control the pandemic. Um, but if you think about it more typically, I think there's no question that there is going to be contraction of social sector spending. But I think what's going to be interesting to see over time is that it's all, there will also be repurposing. So we've seen the government announce a number of fiscal packages. Um, so you have a lot more money now being announced or at least allocated for the Rural Employment Guarantee Act. Um, you have a lot more that is being announced at least um, for the public distribution system, um, as well as um, for some of the, of course, health um, system strengthening as well. 
So there's going to be a lot of repurposing. Um, I think what has been confusing um, right now, and that's what that's what I meant about it's going to be a lot of wait and watch. And for groups like us, um, that's always a little frustrating, uh, especially when data is not always very easily available. Um, but the Ministry of Finance recently uh, announced that at least for the first two quarters of the fiscal year, the certain ministries have been told that they should cut down um, their expenditure as part of the expenditure management. And of course, the slowdown in revenue collection is going to impact um, us, not just in the immediate, but also for many years to come. And so that's where it's going to become quite interesting, um, especially since in some ways the social sector is often the most neglected sector. But right now, I think it's become even more important. Um, and it's interesting have kind of prioritized it to some degree, at least in terms of some of the welfare schemes that are now being announced. Um, it was a need, so it's not something that they could have avoided, but it's still definitely going to be um, a confusing year for social sector expenditure, where I think in certain areas, we're going to see a lot of um, possible expansion. So hopefully in health, um, there, there will be some expansion of social sector spending, but you'll also see contraction in a number of um, sectors. I was talking to someone and I was saying, um, and they were talking about the fear in some ways that a lot of th progress that India has made, even with respect to the SDGs, and this is of course not just an India specific problem, but across the globe, how are we, are we going to see a setback in all of that? Um, and I think for certain sectors like education, it's, it is quite worrying what the future holds. Um, we have schools that are closed. We have people. Uh, children who are not in school. So I think the progress that we've made for so many years of trying to get people, we finally were in a place where we had children back in schools. Um, and now we are probably going to see a lot of dropout. I don't think technology has reached the level um, in India to be able to be a substitute for in-class, in-person learning. So I think that we, what we need to do, and that's probably what the government is trying, but again, how successful they are will remains to be seen as reprioritize. Um, I think there are phases um, that the pandemic has also thrown up. So phase one was immediate response, which is where expand social security, expand, expand PDS, expand the health sector. Um, phase two is of course trying to going to be trying to bring up demand. How do you ensure rural demand? So how do you ensure that you're directing expenditure towards consumption and increased consumption? And then uh, phase three will hopefully be sustainability and just trying to see how do we get back on track. So it's going to be interesting to watch. Um, right now, unfortunately, for groups like us, there isn't enough data um, out there to know. Uh, so we've done budget analysis of what many states have put out budgets prior to the pandemic. Um, so we did analyze those, but we do know that they don't really hold as much value right now. So we're all eagerly waiting to see the new budgets and the supplementary budgets being announced soon. So we kind of get a sense of the direction in which social sector spending is going to go. Thanks, Avni. I think uh, you raised some important points there. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, access to data in this time is one of the major concerns. And uh, we have seen that certain states are much more progressive uh, in, in their uh, publishing of data and some are still lacking the, uh, the need to publish data timely. How do you see uh, the need for channelizing advocacy efforts to help governments get more data out? I think it's definitely, and I think states are, quite ripe for this conversation right now as well. Um, I think what has been interesting in this time is that you've, you've had lots of states reaching out to civil society organizations as well. Um, we immediately, after the pandemic, I think there was a realization that we're all in, it, in this together and the government alone can't do this without the help of civil society organizations. Um, so you have had many, so apart from the Niti Aayog, I know of many states and many ministries that have reached out to civil society organizations. I think the I think the problem therein lies is that there still isn't enough on the public access. So it still yeah. becomes very personal relations. So I'm working with you. I'll give you access to the data and help me improve my system. But how do you reach 
make it reach every citizen. I don't think there's enough advocacy around that at all. And and particularly the I think the COVID pandemic has made the it's this whole relationship between the state and citizen um, has been so much based on trust in some ways. So government announces lockdown, no one please step out of your home. Government says, if you feel these symptoms, please self isolate. And there is this trust building that is expected, but I think that it needs to be a two way street. So I think as governments and some states, as you said, have done better, have been more transparent about their data. Um, I think that feeling of, is then becomes a little bit more mutual saying that okay we we are in it together and people are being transparent but right now any form of lack of transparency becomes even more scary uh, especially since this is a fearful time so i would definitely think that this is the need now more than ever there's a need to put out all information on expenditures let the public know what is being spent especially since so much is being spent um, in certain sectors and so, and that will also put out easily available information on where the gaps are, uh, especially when you're calling for civil, again, individuals and companies and um, NGOs to put money for relief. So you put out information on what inform, um, what you're currently spending on, um, they would immediately come up, you, you would get a, get a sense of where the gaps are and where others could possibly contribute as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and, and I think in the regard, one of the important data source is public procurement. Uh, a lot of spending uh, is happening through public procurement, especially in a time in an emergency like this, uh, be it the medical supplies, be it the infrastructure, uh, be, it, be it the vaccines, uh, all of that is being procured uh, through public procurement. But in India, still access to public procurement information is very limited. Uh, you should we should hear from Ben, like how how are things globally in terms of open contracting, Ben, and and do you see a major shift in in COVID nineteen times in in much more proactive publishing of data? That's a good question, Doris. Um, I think so. First of all, um, I think that the the overriding principle is that now more than ever, public procurement needs to be made open by design so that everyone can understand what's, what's happening. Um, you know, Avani talked a lot about um, how this is ordinarily a very opaque process anyway, and, and Gaurav, you touched on that also. So at the best of times, public procurement is so opaque, um, it's so difficult to find out what's going on. Um, and even more so for emergency procurement, because we all know that emergency procurement is, for obvious reasons, often exempt from the usual controls and regulatory safeguards that we would expect for procurement. And, and that's necessary so that we can get speed and we can deliver the things that we need for everybody um, who needs it. But the problem is that the issues that I talked about in my um, a very quick introduction earlier on, it becomes exacerbated, right? So if in normal times we're looking at um, losses from corruption, mismanagement, inefficiency to the tune of 30% during the emergency procurement phases that is multiplied, you know, 10 times over sometimes, depending where you are. So these problems become even more pronounced. Um, in the, I think in the India context also, I think it's worth mentioning, and you, you mentioned that there are 1.3 million cases in India. That's, that's lots of cases and lots of people's lives are being really affected by this. Um, we know that there are already problems from this emergency procurement phase um, across the world, also in India. We've seen that patients are paying more for healthcare in India during this pandemic um, period. We know that India spent did a, a great investigation on that. In some cases, they, they were paying 15 times more than usual. So that's, again, a, a huge escalation of costs, which will necessarily impact those who are poorest the most. We know that they are cases of profiteering, we know that um, N95 masks, for example, the prices have soared sometimes by over 400, 430%. So again, that's huge escalation of costs. We, we've seen the price of thermometers, for example, escalating by over 900%. So we can immediately see that there are some cases of profiteering, there's corruption, there's waste, there's leakage. So we really need to think about, as I said, you know, how do we deal with that to make sure 
people get the life-saving medicines and healthcare that they need. Um, the other thing that I really liked uh, what Avani was talking about is the recovery phase. And I think very often a lot of the conversation and a lot of the narrative on COVID-19 has been focused a lot on the emergency response and not enough has been focused on the recovery phase. And that's really, really key because how do we come out of this pandemic and how do we ensure that livelihoods are protected and, and people have jobs and people can survive and feed themselves? Um, a lot of that response is going to come from infrastructure. So there are many countries across the world, including here in the UK, where Boris Johnson has said that our strategy for recovery is to build, build, build. And again, there's billions of dollars that's going to be invested in infrastructure to try and stimulate the economy, create jobs and ensure that you know, wealth uh, continues to flow. And as Avani says, consumption increases. And again, they're, they're, they're very obvious issues, right? Because it's easy to invest but it's less easy to ensure how the social impact or the environmental impacts that we want from procurement actually flows to, to the people that, that, and, and, and the way that we want it to. So I think those are really, really key questions. And again, when we talk about infrastructure, um, there are so many opportunities for leakage. There's so many things that can go wrong because there's so many different stakeholders involved um, in the process, you know, unlike uh, goods and services procurement, for example, you, you want a thousand pens, you purchase a thousand pens, you pay for it, you get a thousand pens, whereas infrastructure is different. So we need to make sure that we're designing infrastructure for the that's being invested in the recovery phase so that it meets the needs uh, of the people so that we can get to that third phase, uh, phase that Avani was talking about in terms of the sustainability and the, the longer term sustainability. So I think that's really, really key. As, as as the, the, the benchmark for which we frame this narrative, right? In terms of your, in terms of answering your question directly on, on whether or not we're seeing radical shifts in procurement, I think the answer is yes or no, and, and yes and no, right? So in, in some cases, yes, and, and in some cases, no. Um, there are definitely um, countries and programs around the world that have really stepped up their efforts to do this. Um, we've seen in the Ukraine, for example, the anti-corruption reforms there oblige all emergency contracts to be published in full, and that has to be published as open data. That includes um, terms of payment, uh, delivery, and value, and these are the things that we want to see, right? Um, and they're, they're linked to that. We've seen that civil society has started building business intelligence tools so that you can monitor medical procurement, um, which are obviously linked to emergency spending, because you really want to know what are the price differences for COVID-19 um, tests, medicines, et cetera. And, and now in Ukraine, you can definitely do that for, for testing. And I think that's key because obviously we want to make sure that as many people as possible can be tested and they can get the treatment that they need. We've seen in Colombia, again, um, their digital procurement um, for COVID-19 procurement, whatever that may be, whether it's um, goods, medicines, or, or related services, has helped to um, increase the speed and effectiveness of delivery, which I think is really great. Um, the, the one pattern, or the, one of the patterns that we've noticed in terms of how this plays out, is that those countries that are already, um, that have already embarked on an open contacting program or a digitization uh, process for procurement, have been able to respond more quickly. So in that sense, they are more able to open up the emergency procurement uh, related to COVID-19. And, and that's why Ukraine and Colombia, for example, have been um, so successful because they already have the, um, the mechanisms in place to be able to do this. So I think that's, that's one of the things that we need to be looking at. So firstly, obviously, how do we leverage those countries where they already have advanced and sophisticated systems that can uh, track procurement, that can monitor procurement and make it open so that others can understand what's going on? But also, how do we ensure that no one is left behind? How do we deal with those um, countries, states, you know, subnational levels where they may not have such sophisticated systems, they may not have um, the tools where they can collect the data and publish the data in an, in an open data format that's standardized, structured, machine readable so that everyone can understand what's going on. And that's the real challenge, right? And I understand that in India, although you do have some procurement data available, um, very often if you want the detailed contracting data, you may have to go to 
up to 30 or more different platforms to get all that information. And as a user, as a citizen, that's a huge investment of time that we couldn't expect any normal person on the street to, to be able to do, right? And then on top of that, even once you get the data, it's not in standardized format, it's not machine readable, it's often behind capture. So how are you going to make that accessible for people? And I think this is where open contracting comes in. And we've been trying to help um, lots of different contexts, um, lots of different countries, governments, civil society, media, do this in different ways so that we can make it as accessible as possible. So I think that process is starting. I don't think that it's fully there yet. I think we still have a long way to go to get this fully open by design concept, uh, procurements that are across the board, um, you know, open by default, as you might say, or open by design, so that it's really, really easy for everyone to, to access the information, to play with the data, to understand what's going on. So we're, we're, we're quite a way from the end goal. Thank you, Gaurav. Th thanks, Van. I think that's a lot of insight for us. So just quickly summarizing what Avni said and what you mentioned, Van. So uh, I think Avni, Avni raised a very important point that uh, this is a this is a difficult time for social sector, uh, especially social sector spending, and we would see new things coming from this. Uh, it might uh, be good for certain sectors, say health, where there might be certain more focus on it, uh, and we might improve our SDC targets on there. But at the same time, there is a risk that we might superly underperform in, in sectors like education um, because th there are so many students again out of school because of the pandemic. And there's more need for state governments to uh, participate with civil society groups and, and open up more data for everyone uh, so that there is much more analysis and much more trust building with, with citizens. Similarly, what Ben mentioned uh, is a more, much more need to look into emergency procurements now because a, a lot of the procurements are emergency procurements but not detailed information is being released around them um, especially when it comes to state and sub uh, sub regional uh, uh, geographies and especially most of them might not have the right capacity to publish this data so uh, it increases the responsibility of all the groups like us to help help these organizations publish this data much more effectively and, and build that trust with the citizens so that uh, we, can, we can have better financial reforms in, in this pandemic. And once it's step, uh, what Civic Data Lab has been doing is, um, is, is working with CBGA to launch Himachal Fiscal Data Explorer. Uh, this data explorer is uh, an opportunity for citizens in, in Himachal Pradesh to access budget spending and as well as hopefully procurement data in future. Uh, in an open format at one place and several uh, civil society organizations and advocacy groups can analyze this information. Um, this work is uh, thankfully supported by Chintuguria Foundation's Tech for Dev initiative and, uh, uh, and and hopefully we we hope that some of this work which we have done in the last couple of months would would help uh, citizens in Himachal Pradesh and, and, and other parts of the states as well to uh, look into some of the data, crucial data, which, which was earlier not very accessible and make some much more informed decision in this geography. Uh, thanks a lot, Avni. Thanks a lot, Ben, for all your inputs. I would now hand over to Shreya to quickly present what we have done on the Marshall Fiscal Data Explorer part. And then you would come back to you to hear your feedback on, on our efforts. Hey, Gaurav, thank you all for uh, such a great panel discussion. Uh, now I'll go ahead and uh, talk about our journey of how we came uh, and uh, came to this uh, Fiscal Data Explorer. So Civic Data Lab, in collaboration with CBGA from last two years, has been engaged in answering the question of flow, money flow in fiscal data ex uh, ecosystem across different tiers of government, such as union, state, district, etc. This resulting in resulted in developing uh, different analytical tools, uh, such as Union Budget Board and Assam Budget Explorer. We also created a prototype uh, to, uh, to explore spending patterns in Balasore and Krishna districts. 
we uh, we uh, by by these tools uh, we presented open data in a much more easy to consume uh, and interactive format using diff different visualizations however to understand the fiscal flow of a state one should not stop at the state level but also analyze the districts by spending and receipts data this helps in understanding uh, how district is raising its revenue and using the fund allocated to it by analyzing this data, one can answer queries such as how much was spent on a primary school building uh, every week uh, from a district and a state level. This data can easily be curated using uh, finance uh, department's uh, portal of some states which uploads their district-wise data on a daily basis like Himachal uh, Pradesh. Analyze this, analyzing this kind of data have a have a greater potential to strengthen the course of research around public finance and also uh, not it not only standard uh, strengthens the course of research but it also helps civic civil society organizations to uh, improve their path of advocacy to the concerned government we believe that simplifying uh, this uh, open budget data at sub sub state level uh, will increase transparency as well as bring a lot of public awareness, uh, which will in turn result in uh, result in public participation in budgetary process, which is I think very much required in this uh, in this time. Therefore, as Gaurav said, in collaboration with CBG and Tech for Dev, we developed a tool called Himachal Pradesh Fiscal Data Explorer. Now you must be uh, wondering why Himachal Pradesh. So uh, Himachal Pradesh Finance Department uploads district by spending data on regular basis on their uh, uh, finance uh, portal that is Himkosh, which is much more granular and much more informative as compared to other uh, other states. Now the question is, why do we need Fiscal Data Explorer? So. Uh, so there are various reasons that we came across after after two years of uh, uh, analyzing public finance data. Uh, firstly, there is a lack of accessibility to this kind of detailed data uh, present across op uh, internet across open, and there is lack of usability. So the data, in, uh, the format in which the data is presented in uh, these on these uh, governmental portals is uh, is not usable there are a lot of jargons that they use and they uh, they do not have metadata list for a normal person to go and explore this kind of data moreover there is a lack, lack of segregated information on how each sector is performing in terms of uh, expenditure and revenue and now now in now times we really need to uh, need to analyze what schemes uh, government is uh, presenting and how these schemes are performing so there's no option present till now to do that so uh, what is uh, fiscal data explorer fiscal data explorer uh, fiscal data explorer is a tool where citizens can explore both budgets and spending data of himachal pradesh in an easy to comprehend and simple to use method now let's go and uh, check uh, check one of the uh, portal that himachal uses to upload their uh, upload their finance information this is himkosh so and and uh, let's go to their on, uh, online financial reporting uh, section to this here, here in this section uh, they upload data uh, of different stakeholders how are they performing in terms of finances uh, stakeholders can be hod's can be uh, drawing and disbursing officers uh, across different heads uh, so let's explore let's try to get an information from this portal and see how easy and difficult this is so if i go to a link uh, this this gives you uh, how how each head of department is performing in terms of allocation and expenditure you can select various uh, range here and the data is available from 2016 to 2020 uh, to the present date you can select whatever query you want now uh, if i'm a if i'm a person who doesn't know public finance data i would be really confused what demand it what is demand what is hoa and moreover they have given an optional uh, option to choose what demand in in uh, you want to see so if, if i want to see education then i have to know its code that is 08 
but I won't know because there is no meta metadata present. Let's try to query this uh, information. You can also select different units here. Sorry, I think uh, because of, yeah. So as you can see, the data is present in HTML format and there's no download download option. So without expertise, you won't be able to download it across time range for your analysis. Moreover, uh, there, there are different uh, random numbers given. The, these are head heads, uh, which is responsible for making expenditure. But uh, I uh, we do not know for now what is 0, 01 and what is 2011. Assessing all these uh, problems in their uh, in their portal, we came uh, to uh, came uh, and we we gathered all this problem and developed uh, this tool. Now uh, let me take you through uh, expenditure summary uh, section of this tool. This section is mainly responsible to give an overview of expenditure incurred by different budget heads of uh, uh, Himachal Pradesh across different fiscal uh, years. So the bubble, the bubble, uh, the uh, size of bubble gives you uh, the amount, uh, the amount uh, that they have allocated or ex exp is spent. So if you go to 2019 and so and go here, you can see what how irrigation, water uh, irrigation, water supply and sanitation demand uh, is uh, how how it's located. So it has currently uh, three four nine two crore uh, rupees allocated for 2019. Similarly, you can switch between uh, uh, the tabs and see how uh, how it has been uh, performing in terms of expenditure. Now to explore how uh, how the trend of this demand across years are, you can go to time series tab and you can write irrigation water supply. As you see uh, that uh, there is an evident gap between allocated and the amount that they have spent uh, across years. Uh, there is also an option to uh, look into the table. This table is searchable. Uh, so if I search for irrigation, and you can download this table in form of uh, machine readable formats like uh, CSV and JSON and uh, take out your own insight. So uh, as I as I said that it, it has been performing uh, uh, bad in terms of spending across years. This this column can give you the information of how much percentage they have spent uh, across years. So it, it has been 28% uh, expenditure by this department for, in 2019-20. Now let me uh, take you through uh, district-wise expenditure uh, tab. So this this section mainly gives you information on aggregated account of all all expenditure made by government, as well as more detailed accounts of expenditure across time, district, treasuries, and drawing and disbursing officers. There are different uh, views that you can explore using this section. Uh, there is a map view. There's a bar chart view. In bar chart view, you can compare different districts, how they're performing in expenditure. There is a time series view uh, where you can uh, you can compare and see how uh, different districts have performed across time. Uh, there, there are two ranges available, weekly and monthly. And you can switch between gross, net payment, and, uh, and you can also see both here. As I, as I explained in last expenditure summary uh, uh, expenditure summary section, there is an option for table uh, where you can download, search, sort uh, if you want to find out who who which which district has spent the most. You can just search uh, sort it accordingly. Now let me take you through a very interesting insight that we got while uh, while traversing through this uh, tool. If I select education as in demand. Uh, and uh, uh, you will see that uh, there there are some districts which have uh, which have uh, expenditure missing in uh, education and general education subheads. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's taking time to load because of some internet issues.
And if I select uh, general education here, similarly, if you're wondering what demand and what major head is, you can directly click on the I button and uh, uh, curl out the information and have a look. Or you can also visit our section called glossary and search there uh, about all the jargons uh, that we have used uh, that we have got from the data of the site. So if you can see uh, that there are few districts like Lahore, Spiti, Chamba uh, is missing uh, from from uh, from the map. But uh, last time I remember they have they also have colleges and school. So then we we uh, we visited a demand called tribal development. Uh, tribal uh, since these uh, these districts fall under tribal regions, so there might be a case that they have been spending through tribal development demand. And I'll select general education here. Yeah, as you can see now, uh, these uh, there is a spending in these districts. And I would say it's quite a good amount of spending. Uh, and you can also explore time series uh, wise uh, expenditure here. Now, uh, now uh, there are uh, different sections uh, about receipts and schemes and COVID-19. You can explore these sections as in similar way that we have explored the expenditure district wise section. For scheme section, I would like to call uh, Preeti and uh, ask her to explain how you can explore different schemes and its related expenditure. Preeti. Thanks, Shreya. Uh, I, 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 I'll uh, request you to keep sharing the screen. So, sure. uh, uh, okay. Hi, everybody. So, for the scheme section, what we did was uh, we have a set of uh, 21 uh, schemes, uh, both centrally sponsored as well as state schemes that we have selected. Uh, the way we curated this was basically twofold. Uh, one was we looked for schemes that had the most uh, important social and economic uh, sector schemes that we could uh, think of. So basically to do with education, to do with women and children development, uh, to do with uh, agriculture, etc. And secondly, we tried to look for schemes where most of the funds were flowing through the state treasuries. So based on this, we came up with an uh, a uh, non-exhaustive list of 21 schemes. Uh, the scheme section is formatted the same way as the district-wise expenditure section that Shreya just took us through, uh, except it has two uh, other tabs. One is the schemes tab, which uh, has all the names of the scheme, so you can search by scheme. And the second one is the type tab, which has uh, information on uh, whether it's centrally sponsored or a state scheme. So maybe uh, we can look at one particular scheme uh, to sort of better explain this. And of course, please go ahead and look at this uh, more deeply by yourself. So one of the things that has uh, that has been coming up again and again in news reports and uh, press releases has been the fact that uh, pensions have been uh, dispersed at uh, like advanced as well as an extra pension has been dispersed during the COVID-19 pandemic that has happened. So uh, now while there are press releases about it, it's kind of hard to track the actual uh, flow of funds. Uh, so we just took one of the national so social assistance uh, program uh, scheme uh, under which uh, I think the one we are looking at right now is the Indira Gandhi National Disabled Pension Scheme. So uh, what you could do, what we did, uh, was to look at um, the uh, spending for the year 2021 uh, from April to June. So you have uh, here all the districts that have spent for, for these months, and it comes up to around 18 crores. And similarly, if you uh, go to 2019-20, so this is the last year, and you basically uh, change the dates to exactly mirror the same timeline that we have looked at now. Uh, you can see that around uh, 10 crores have been spent. Now, uh, I have to make it very clear that you cannot, I mean, it's very speculative uh, at this point, like, you know, saying that the, these, this increase in funds or whatever, or this increase in spending is COVID related. It is speculative because at the moment, there is no code that actually distinguishes COVID related spending that is happening. So uh, we don't know that, but we can say that there are a few comparisons like this that we can make. 
so this is just one of this. Now, if you want at a later stage, I'm not going to go through it right now, you could also go and see who are the DDOs who have been spending on these schemes and how they've been spending on it. Uh, but this, this is just, uh, yeah, for later use. Uh, so maybe we can move to the COVID-19 section next. Uh, so, um, yeah, so while we were making this uh, Explorer, one of the things as in, as the pandemic uh, raged on in the country as well as in the world, it became apparent that we needed to track uh, a state spending towards COVID-19. Uh, in India especially, uh, it is really hard to do that because most of the information is in press releases and grandiose statements that are being said or on telegram groups or whatever it is, but uh, there isn't actually quantifiable information out there about exactly what the country as well as the state is spending for COVID-19. So uh, we had a few data thons to sort of understand what kind of reliable data sources there are out there. Now, please note that this is actually a very uh, prototype uh, of a uh, tab. Uh, we would like your information on how better, how to better it, how to make it more useful. So we looked at uh, what kind of information was out there. So there are uh, government orders uh, that relate to spending information. There is also disaster management authorities uh, for different states that put this information out. And of course, there are some press releases. So we thought the best way, uh, so we have three ways in which we have represented our information. The first one is a timeline. Uh, the timeline has information about the government orders. So uh, when when the uh, when the state went into lockdown, when gatherings were banned, what, how much money has been given to ASHA workers as honorarium for working these four months, uh, information like that, as well as uh, the disaster management authority. Uh, disperses a certain amount of funds, and they actually uh, put this information out very clearly. So uh, we've tracked all of that, and we've overlaid it, of course, on top of the COVID-19 cases that were actually happening in the state. So this is the first part of our tab. Uh, if you go down, Shreya, uh, to the table, um, we after that, we made a table of the same thing. This basically has information of the financial orders uh, uh, for the state, which are related to uh, which are related to COVID-19 spending, as well as uh, donations to the SDMA, which were, I mean, the Disaster Management Authority, which were then uh, dispersed for different reasons. Now, this is, again, downloadable and searchable. So if you want, you can put PPE in there and see how, how much exactly has been spent towards uh, PPE kits in the state. Uh, the other thing, uh, and now again, I keep reiterating this, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, this is what we have tried to do in the last couple of months and any any anything to make this better is good for us. Uh, the last thing that we did was uh, we put these did you knows. So you have, um, there are clear patterns like the one I just showed you about pensions that are uh, that come up when you look at comparative data between this year and last year and the year before. And, um, and while this cannot be confirmedly said that it is because of COVID-19, you can say that it could be because of it. And some of them, there are very clear patterns that it probably is because of it. Um, so we put those down as did you knows at the moment. And we are also releasing an article with uh, more information about this after the release of this uh, explorer. Uh, but we have put some analytics together in the presentation that uh, Shreya was um, sharing until just now. Uh, Shreya? Sure. Also, there is a bit of a, a feedback from your end. So if you're not speaking, can you go on mute, please? Um, Shreya, can you move to the next slide? Uh, yeah, so uh, some of the insights that we have seen uh, for uh, for during these months, uh, we basically calculated the total amount of revenue for Himachal Pradesh uh, from 2017 to 2020 for the months of April to June. And you can see that there is uh, a reduction in uh, revenue a very clear reduction in revenue uh, for this year compared to the last few. Uh, while there are still uh, unnegotiable expenditures that are uh, taking place on a regular basis, you can see that some departments have reduced their expenditure quite a bit, uh, while other departments have 
uh, have to have certain uh, expenditures that are happening. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Shreya. Um, yeah, so this is basically a slightly more, uh, a, a, a little deeper look into the revenue, uh, which like how the difference in revenue, say for SGST, for stamps and registration, uh, for power, for education and taxes. Um, you can see how it has changed this year compared to the last. Um, now, all of this information we took from our, uh, I mean, we took from the Explorer that we just made, but you can take it from there or you can take it from Himkosh as well. It's just a little more tiring from Himkosh, that's it. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, we've just put some information on which departments are spending a lot more uh, this year compared to the last. Uh, one of it is a social justice and empowerment department, which I just showed you uh, about the pensions. It comes under this, and it's primarily pensions that uh, lead to this uh, increase in spending. And the other one is food and civil supplies, where all of that spending increase is because of food subsidies that have happened uh, during the COVID uh, epidemic. Um, I think. I think that's yeah that's that's the uh, so yeah this is slightly more disaggregated information like I was mentioning the food storage and warehousing as well as the pensions for social affairs so uh, yeah so this is the kind of information we have out there and you can I mean this is of course a very general in, uh, information that is out there you can go and look more deeply into the DDOs who are spending this on which weeks they're spending is spending happening closer to a certain time period usually you find out that it's happening close to like March before the budgets happen again um so yeah that, that that's about it Shreya do you want to take over thanks thanks Preeti for showing us uh, great COVID-19 insights so what's next uh, for us uh, we have set few targets for next phase a uh, few of them them are so as as i told you uh, himkosh releases data on district wise spending daily on their portal so we also aspire to make our dashboard uh, dynamic so that it uploads that takes the data and uploads on a more frequent basis uh, we will be adding few sector specific pages uh, so you will be able to see go and see your favorite sector suppose health how how has been spending in that sector specifically as Preeti mentioned that the COVID-19 tab is in its alpha version uh, we would like to extend it to uh, a tracker where you can explore the spending related to COVID heads uh, as as uh, as you can explore it in district wise expenditure using different interactive visualizations. Uh, procurement tracker with o, with OCP and Ben is uh, and Ben's collaboration. We we have been trying to uh, we have been trying to track tenders related to COVID-19 and we are soon going to launch a procurement data uh in in this dashboard uh dashboard going ahead and we are going to start a forum uh where you can collaborate with us and make this tool much more powerful as it is uh right now now i would like to hand it over to gaurav thanks uh shreya and Preeti for the wonderful uh walkthrough of the Marshall fiscal data explorer uh, I'm hoping our audience would find it useful. The link has been shared in the chat as well. So please explore it and give your early feedback. Uh, meanwhile, I think both Avni and Ben have got an opportunity to explore this tool in last couple of weeks. Uh, so we would love to hear from them what's their feedback and how can we probably scale this effort to other stages. Uh, Avni, shall we hear first from you? Sure. Um, yes, I managed to get a sneak peek into the explorer a few weeks ago um, which was really nice so thank you for sharing that with me earlier um i think i can see in the audience uh, nilachal and uh, rajesh all of us have struggled often with budget um, and treasury data so i think this just the effort that you're doing of putting it out in the public domain um you you raise a really important point which is that most of the times the information even when it is publicly available which himkosh luckily is it's not really designed for a citizen um how do you know what to look at and that's where groups like us uh, all of us come into play um but even we struggle of just time just 
taking badly formatted PDFs or scanned documents and just creating them into machine readable formats. So congratulations to all of you for doing that. Um, I think in terms of feedback, my only um, suggestion going forward in terms of your next steps um, would be, and I think you did that with some of the other states, is that how do you use this as an advocacy tool to get states to think about it a lot more? I think one of the challenges in India, um, and it will be a challenge that you will face with any tool and we all face with any tool, is that we still think of budgeting very much as an accounting uh, tool. Um, yet the expectations from even citizens like us, um, but also um, I think over a period of time is that you want it to be a accountability tool, you want it to be a fiscal tool, you want it to be a planning tool, but it's not yet designed that way. Um, so there's often a lot of expenditure. So even in terms of complete, completeness of data, it's because it's not being thought of like that, um, there isn't always efforts to do that. Um, I remember um, we, we did... Odisha budget um, treasury tracking and we and again it was a painful process of I think some over six thousand video codes and sitting and actually trying to um, get them all and we got some coders since we're not technologically savvy like all of you to actually download this information and we we thought we had it all and then when we finally started analyzing it and comparing it with the actual budget numbers we realized that there was a lot of the capital expenditure never showed up because they hadn't bothered to put it up yet. Or a lot of the centrally sponsored scheme expenditure wasn't yet up because it was in a different um, PFMS um, domain. So I think there was a lot of centralized expenditure, which one couldn't do district-wise. And these are challenges that we'll all face. Um, so definitely, I would just advise you that in your next steps, I think just getting the state government to start thinking about why it's useful for them to hopefully then prompt them to make more of that data available in a simple format. Um, because right now we're all relying on what's publicly available. So as I say that uh, it, the tool will only be as good as the data that goes into it. Um, so I think you did that in Assam and that I encourage you to do that in other states as well, because hopefully with all your hard work, it will make our life a little easier. <laughs> Thank you. Definitely, Avni, that's, that's very encouraging. and. Uh... Yeah, we, we are in conversation with uh, the Marshall Finance Department and they're pretty open um, so far in terms of uh, getting more data out there. So let's see. Uh, I think in in last couple of weeks, we have seen some PFMS data coming out in MCOSH, which is a great news. And I think it's going to be probably, in my limited understanding, first ever state to put uh, uh, daily spending of uh, PFMS data in, in public domain in, in some form at least. So uh, looking forward to make it as a model for other states to follow as well. Quickly jumping to Ben and hearing from her, how do you see potential of a tool like this? Thanks, Gaurav, and thanks also, Shreya and Preeti, for that excellent uh, presentation. I, I always enjoy your presentations. They're always so well thought out and, and, and visually appealing, so really well done on that. Um, I, so first of all, I, I think the Himachal Fishko is, Explorer is a, a really fantastic tool. I think it is not just useful in terms of what it does to join up data sets and to increase the transparency of the way budgets are allocated, distributed, and spent, um, but also is very engaging in, in the way that the insights are, are presented so that it's um, easy to navigate and easy to understand. So I, I really, really enjoy that. Um, one thing that um, we touched on towards the end of the presentation is what the, the next steps are. And I think that is something that is of particular excitement. So building on all the great work that you've already done on open budgets, which I really think is fantastic, you're also then pushing the boundaries and going even further to join up uh, budgets with procurement, which is something that's really really important right like just it's not enough to stop at budgets i think you know we're we're all on the same page there but really to understand you know once those budgets are allocated and you know distributed how is that actually being spent in terms of the, the public contracts and the public spending in that sense and whether or not it's achieving the results and the impact that we all want right so i think that's really key um the other thing that i think is also really exciting is that you've got a double whammy in the project that we're working on now because you're also in introducing a sector specific uh, approach but also a thematic issue where you're joining up 
infrastructure procurement that's linked to COVID-19 response and potentially recovery in the future and how that all joins back up to, to budgets. And that's something that's really, really cutting edge. It's not anything that I've seen done anywhere else in the world. Um, it expands on the work that we've done open contracting to really lead the charge um, on the open contracting infrastructure data standard, for example, and joining up that process so that you create this kind of upward nesting where the open contracting for infrastructure data standard or OC4IDS joins up contracts to projects and you can now start to do that to join up projects to programs and programs to, to budget. So you have this upward nesting, which is really, really um, at the cutting edge of, of innovation. So I'm really, really excited about that. The, um, I guess a couple of reflections in terms of what would make it even more impactful, and I know you're already thinking about this, um, is to make sure that we're not just stopping at how the procurements are being spent, but really make sure that we're joining up and monitoring uh, through the end-to-end -end procurement cycle as well, right? So once the contracts have been awarded, what are you know what are the indicators that we should be tracking and monitoring and assessing to see whether or not those procurements are actually effective? So, for example, a lot of the work that you've been doing um, on the open budget is to track and see you know once budgets have been approved or allocated, how they're actually dispersed and whether they're dispersed in a timely manner or not. Um, that can permeate through to the procurement. Uh, process as well, and particularly for infrastructure, we know that payments and late payments is a big issue on infrastructure contracts, and that particularly has a very negative effects and huge impacts on contractors and subcontractors and small businesses further down the line. So it'll be interesting to see that once a contract has been awarded, you know how those public sector agencies or government agencies are actually uh, doing payments. Are they making payments on time? Are those payments slowing down the supply chain? So it's not just the main contractors who uh, hold all the money, but is it being dispersed in a timely manner? And we know again that there always are a lot of problems with subcontractors not getting paid at all. Um, you know, sometimes if they are paid, they're being paid late. Um, and that, that causes liquidation issues and that causes lots of companies and the smaller companies particularly to go bust, which is a huge problem in construction. So that's some of the things that we should be thinking about uh, when you're joining up procurement data with budget data. But then even going beyond that, and again, I know you're thinking about this, I think what's really exciting is to see that you know, those procurements that uh, are being done are they actually meeting the needs of citizens? Is it actually transforming lives in a meaningful way? So we know, for example, that um, in the COVID-19 health infrastructure context, we know that 70% of India's population live in rural areas, but we know that rural hospitals only account for about 39% of India's hospital beds. So how do we justify that discrepancy? And how can we ensure that when procurements are designed and contracts are awarded, that the, the, that the distribution of, of, of social welfare and equity is actually reflected in the way money is being spent in the way that contracts are being done. So that you know, it's not just the, the urban uh, or, or the wealthy that benefit from public spending, but also the poorest and most marginalized communities who also have access um, to the health infrastructure investments. So I think those are some of the some of the things that we should think about. So what are the additional indicators that we need to be uh, monitoring to make sure or to understand even if procurement is actually being effective? And then you can have this really holistic, robust picture of how budgets translate into procurement and procurement translates into impact. So I think that whole value chain, that whole life cycle approach is really, really exciting. So we think that the final thing I'll say on that is that Infrastructure as a whole, generally, um, you know, there's going to be a huge focus on that, and, and particularly in India, where 4.5 trillion dollars in investment in infrastructure is needed between now and 2040. Uh, but there's a huge infrastructure spending gap of over half a trillion dollars. So only 3.9 trillion of that will be spent. So it would also be interesting to make sure that we have um, a robust or a comprehensive uh, monitoring process to also understand what the state of investments look like and whether or not there's actually enough investment that's going into infrastructure so that the life-changing um, infrastructure assets and related services are actually flowing to the people. Thanks, Gaur.
thanks a lot ban i think those are really wonderful inputs uh, we would definitely be looking uh, on on all of these issues and 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 would be relying on collective knowledge of uh, uh, all all such organizations like accountability initiative and uh, open contracting partnership and other partners to build understanding on on this and hopefully we would have more public information on on whole fiscal cycles be it the budget spending one or be it the procurement and implementation one uh in much more open format in in coming days to come i would once again thanks a lot to both of you to taking your time to uh on a weekend like this and and speaking on, on such a crucial topic and now uh, giving your views your perspectives on how we can make better fiscal uh, response to covid pandemic as well as uh, giving us meaningful feedback on himachal fiscal leader explorer as we are working to scale that up and and go to other states as well so thanks a lot once again both up me and and ben and thank you thank you for inviting me i've had a great time thank you yes and congratulations got a pretty um, shreya and the rest of the open pacific lab team um continue your good great work on open budgets i think we all end up using it quite a lot and look forward to the analysis for more and more uh, state treasuries yeah fingers crossed uh, <laughs> so i would request uh, now people we are we are open for networking and q and a if you are busy please feel free to drop off uh, uh no worries at all but if you have any any questions for us if you want to network with other members in the forum uh now would be a good time uh, and uh, yeah uh, we would also request our uh, both our email addresses with you and we would drop them over an email to you so in case you have any queries for them you can write to them directly uh or if you can share with us we can we can ensure that they answer that in 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 next week sometime uh thanks a lot everyone we know ban you are joining from a different time zone altogether so uh, please please carry on uh thanks again for joining on over a weekend and and such a different time zone thanks so much gar um and great a great session thanks so much gan and sorry i have to leave but it was great to be here and thanks for having me <laughs>